Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Wednesday, March 15th, 2023. Hope everybody's doing well today. We are in our study of the divided kingdom of Israel. And we're ready for 1 Kings chapter 15 today. And uh, good to see folks joining on. See who we've got here so far. Well, Gail, Louise, and Lyle so far. I know we've got others watching. And of course, we're cross-posted on the Near Churches page. <clears throat> if you have any questions or comments on either one of those pages, use the comment section, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. 1 Kings 15, as you can see on the screen here, if you follow along in the on the live stream, I try to use this text up here and uh, highlight some things that are significant to me in the text. And Today we're going to look at a couple of different kings. So <clears throat> the kingdom is split again. Jeroboam becomes the king of Israel. Rehoboam becomes the king of southern Israel or Judah. And we've, we've dealt with them. Uh, let's see here. Rehoboam. So the kings, of, and I've talked about this, but the, the kings of Judah, southern kingdom of Israel, they're covered in the book of Chronicles. You get more details there typically, whereas the book of Kings, the books of Kings, will record both Israel and Judah. And uh, it's good to know that because if you want more information on the kings of Judah, you just go over to primarily Second Chronicles. <clears throat> but as we get to First Kings chapter 15, uh, well, the, the end of chapter 14 tells us that Jeroboam has died, and a, a man by the name of Nadab reigns in his place. That's 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. We'll talk about Nadab here in just a few minutes, but he's open to 1 Kings chapter 15. And, and you'll see this, and this is kind of, it can be tricky. I'll just say it that way. Um, as you're going through the kings, you'll see these statements. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. So there's a lot of overlapping in the remainder of 1 Kings and about the first half of 2 Kings. You know, by the time of 2 Kings 17, the northern kingdom of Israel is done. Okay, they're, they're carried off into captivity by Tiglath-Pileser and the Assyrian Empire. And so after, <clears throat> essentially after 2 Kings 17... Now we're just focused on the kings of of Judah, but from but from First Kings fifteen to Second Kings seventeen, you're gonna you're gonna read a lot of statements like this in the eighteenth year of so and so, this of Israel, this person became king in Judah, and so it's you see all the names, but the overlapping can be a bit confusing. So Abijam becomes king of Judah, and you'll notice that he reigned three years in Jerusalem. Some of them were told who their mother was. Um, but then we're always told this about all the kings, whether it's the king of Israel or Judah, we're told what, you know, what their character was. Well, Abijam, the second king of southern Israel, Judah, he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord, his God, as was the heart of his father, David. Now, this is going to be something that appears a few times in the upcoming text. Nevertheless, 1 Kings 15, 4. For David's sake, the Lord gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. And this is not a literal object with a light on top of it. This is, this is the conception of hope. of um, Because one of the things that David was told, and this goes back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, that his, uh, the, the throne of David would continue, and ultimately, of course, there would, there would be one who would come, set up the kingdom. And that, of course, is applied to Jesus in Acts chapter 2. Uh, but it says here, a lamp in Jerusalem, by setting up his son after him and by, uh, well, I just hit a wrong button and I don't know what that is. Okay, there we go. Um, by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem, because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, of course, David and Bathsheba. But this idea of a lamp, okay, this source of hope, this source of light that's going to remain in Jerusalem through the, through the um, kings of Judah. And, you know, when you go to Matthew chapter 1, for instance, in, for instance, and you read the lineage of Christ, 
Matthew chapter 1 traces it to David, to Solomon, from Solomon to Rehoboam, and, and you see the kings of Judah. That, you know, that Jesus' lineage is the royal lineage. And so this is all in fulfillment of the promises that God made to David as recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So like in the margin of my Bible, uh, my personal Bible, when I see this kind of thing here, because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord, he left him this lamp in Jerusalem, I just write out next to that 2 Samuel chapter 7. So I know, you know, I'm always reminded of what exactly that means. So just a little, <laughs> little bit of information there, maybe helpful to you, maybe not, whatever. But then you notice this, verse 6, there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, and again, I pointed this out to you yesterday, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. Okay, so looking at your biblical text here, that's, uh, what is that, verse 7. So if you have like cross-references in your um, center column or at the bottom of your Bible page, it'll reference you over to Second Chronicles chapter 13. So if you want to read more information about Abijam, go to Second Chronicles chapter 13, and uh, that information will be laid out there for you. But again, you notice primarily the thing we are told is that he was evil and he didn't follow the ways of David. A majority of your kings of Judah are going to be that way, and all of the kings of Israel are that way. Um, but there are, <clears throat> I'm wanting to say eight. Eight of the kings of Judah are good kings, reformer kings, faithful. And uh, so the, the, the kingdom of Judah lasts about 150 years longer than the northern kingdom of Israel after after David. So you turn over to Second Chronicles chapter 13, and again, it, it records in, um, that chapter, that's the whole chapter, about Abijam. Now, and, and here's another thing to keep in mind. So you guys know that, you know, you guys who watch, hey Anna, good to see you, that I use the New King James Version. Some I know use the, the King James, but whatever. One of the things you will notice as you're studying the kings is the different names. Okay, some of them have two names, some of them have three. Like, for instance, at the end of Judah, you have one king whose name is Coniah, but in Scripture he's also called Jeconiah, and in other places he's, he's also called Jeconias. And so you have to be careful. But like for Abijam here, in 1 Kings 15, you turn over to Second Chronicles 13, and his name there is Abijah. It's the same king, it's just a bit of a different, uh, a different spelling and so you'll notice that with, with actually several of your kings. But anyway, he's evil. Um, he dies. He's buried in the city of his father, David, and Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. But when you go to Second Chronicles, uh, I tell you what, I'll just um, turn over here in my Bible real quick. You go over to Second Chronicles chapter 13, um, and verse. Th there's an interesting verse, and I've done some study on this in the past. Second Chronicles chapter 13 and verse 5. I want you to notice this. I'll start reading in verse 4. Abijah stood on Mount uh, Zimmeram, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, and he said, Hear me, Jeroboam, and all Israel. Again, there's tension still between the northern and southern tribes. They're trying to go to battle. Verse 5 says, Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of salt? Okay, a covenant of salt. This actually goes back to the old law. Um, well, obviously, we're in the Old Testament. But you can go to Numbers chapter 18 and read about that, this covenant of salt. It's, a, it's the concept of, of preservation. Um, God made a promise to David, and he's going to preserve that. Um, and, and his, his effort, uh, Abijah, Abijam, his effort in not going to battle with Jeroboam and northern Israel is based on this covenant, again, that God made to David, which again is referred to as a covenant of salt. Good morning, Connie. Good to see you. Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. So, Second Chronicles 13 We'll follow that um, with a bit more information than, than the book of Kings will give you. Um, and it, again, of the 19 kings of northern Israel, 
all of them are evil. And, and remember what I've told you, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first king, is the standard bearer. Because 14 kings after him, of, of those 14 kings, it said, uh, and they departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which he caused Israel to sin. Of course, the idolatry, we've talked about that, but you just see his wickedness here in in Second Chronicles 13, where Abijam's trying to make peace based on the covenant that God made with David, and he's not going to have it. Uh, Jeroboam's not going to have it. Well, then worthless rogues gathered to him and strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and inexperienced and could not withstand them. So th th that's just more information you can read on your own. Um, Je Jeroboam causes an ambush to go out against Judah. Um, and ultimately, you get down here to Second Chronicles 13 and verse 19. Um, well, verse 18 tells us that the children of Israel were subdued. But verse 19 says, Abijah pursued Jer uh, Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages. And remember, Bethel is the city, well, one of the two cities where Jeroboam had set up a, a golden calf for Israel to worship. Um, Jeshana with its villages, Ephraim with its villages. So Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him and he died. So there you go. And a little bit more information about Abijah, the second king of Judah. He grew mightily, married 14 wives. So again, you, you go back to David, eight wives. Solomon, you know, he's notorious for his wives and concubines. Abijah has 14 wives, 22 sons, 16 daughters. And then he dies. But then notice this, and I mentioned this to you yesterday. Um, the rest of the acts of Abijah, his ways, his sayings, are written in the annals of the prophet of Idu. So you have several books, in, particularly in the Kings and Chronicles, that are historical documents that are not preserved for us in Scripture. They're not part of the canon of Scripture. But it's just interesting to note um, that the Bible even references, I guess that's a good way to say it, these other uh, books that confirm or that verify maybe what we're reading about in Scripture. So 1 Kings chapter 15, it's just eight verses. Hey, good morning, Lottie. Eight verses that deal essentially with Abijah, Abijam, depending on, you know, again, what book you're reading. The third king of Judah is Asa. And Asa was one of the good kings. And so I've got, I would have to do some digging. If you guys, and, and I may have sent it out to some already, but I have the chronology of these kings um, how they overlapped with each other. If you would be interested in that, um, you can actually just Google it. If you'd like to do that kind of stuff, do a little of your own research. Google um, the kings of Israel and Judah. And there are all kinds of charts and um, timelines that will show you all the overlapping. And uh, it's, it's very beneficial to know that. Again, if you're, uh, if you're a serious Bible student and you read your Bible, like, like right now, I read five chapters a day from the Old Testament and five chapters a day from the New Testament. That's just my personal reading plan. And right now I'm in Second Chronicles. I, I forget what chapters I read last night, but I'm in Second Chronicles. And every time you read through these sections, um, it's good to, if you've got st stuck away somewhere in your own notes, these um, uh, timelines that, that lay out the chronology that show you the overlapping of the different kings. We have a grocery store here in um in just well just across the line in Missouri in Thayer Missouri and they have a little book section and I've seen this in a lot of little grocery stores and Walmart's will have uh, Walmart stores will have them um, there's a company called Rose Publishing R-O-S-E Rose Publishing and they do things like Bible maps Bible timelines Bible charts I've actually got three of those in my library that I've bought at this grocery store here in Thayer Missouri and man they're extremely helpful Yeah, in fact, I was just looking over my shoulder here. The last one I bought is, um, it's it's made like a book, but it's actually, you open it, and it's a huge fold-out. It just keeps unfolding, and it has the biblical timeline, I mean, from beginning to end of the biblical record, and of course, in that is the record of the king. So next time you're in your grocery store, or you're, or you're in a Walmart, check the book section, and look for those um, charts and maps and timelines made by Rose Publishing. Anyway, kind of 
diverted there a little bit, but those things are very good and helpful um, in your study of the Bible. So you've got Rehoboam, Abijah, now Asa, the third king of southern Israel. But you'll notice these first three kings of Israel are all in the days of Jeroboam, king of Israel. So you've got one king in Israel now. You've got the third king in Judah. So like I said, that can be a bit confusing if you try to keep all that straight. At least it is to me. If you don't um, maybe have it written out somewhere or a timeline to look at. So Asa, notice, becomes in the 20th year of Jeroboam. Now Jeroboam only reigns for 22 years. Asa is going to reign for 41 years in Judah. So there are going to be um, several kings of Israel that do their that, that have their reign during the 41 years of Asa. So, uh, oh yeah, Connie says, I have the Rose Bible charts, maps, and timelines. Yeah, they're, I, I really enjoy those. They've, they've been very helpful to me. Anyway, we're told of Asa. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. He banished, and here's this word again. We've already run into it once. He banished the perverted persons. Let me see if I can do something here. I don't know how my... See if I can pull up... Yeah, there we go. I'll pull up a King James Version. What verse was that? Okay, yeah, 1 Kings 15, 12. And the King James says, He took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. And you, you notice this word Sodomites here. And uh, now that I know that, <laughs> let me get back to my new King James. And it uses the... It uses the phrase, uh, the perverted persons. But you notice it connects, well, not necessarily connects, but in the same phrase it mentions, removes all the idols from his fathers that his fathers had made. If you want to read more details about the perverted persons of the land, read Leviticus chapter 18. I think I mentioned that yesterday. And you have the description. I'll tell you what. Let's just do it. Leviticus chapter 18. You notice here the heading in this particular chapter, Laws of Sexual Morality. So Asa, the third king of southern Israel, the third king of Judah, drives out the perverted persons, New King James, the sodomites of the King James. These are, there are different groups, okay? In, in other words, there were perverted persons. There were sodomites in the sense of idol worship. This was like a part of pagan worship. And you even run into that, um, concept in the New Testament, um, like male temple prostitutes. There were female temple prostitutes. Uh, this was a this was a part of pagan worship, and, and that's you know we don't see that today in like denominationalism and things like that. But this was a common occurrence. So you get to Leviticus chapter eighteen as the children of Israel are wandering through the wilderness, going to the promised land. And let me see here. Well, the first five verses is basically like, keep my judgments, laws, statutes, and commandments. And then you get to verse 6 of Leviticus 18, and it starts getting very specific. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. And you will see that phrase throughout Leviticus 18 and in other parts of the Old Testament. And that's a reference to um, the uh, sexual relationship. And again, it gets very specificness, very specific uh, throughout the rest of this chapter. For instance, verse 7, The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother, you shall not uncover her nakedness. That, <clears throat> again, this is something that was being practiced in the land of Canaan before the Israelites got there. And see, that's, the, that's one of the significant things. Like, you read the books of Joshua, well, particularly the book of Joshua, and then... Numbers and Deuteronomy, God repeatedly says, don't make covenants with these people. When you get to the land, drive them out, because if you don't, they're going to become a thorn in your side. Well, Joshua is the book of conquerings. But even in the book of Joshua, we're told a few times that there were certain groups within the land of Canaan that Israel did not drive out. And then, of course, you get to the book of Judges, and it's it's time after time. Israel defeated these people, but instead of driving them out, they put them under tribute. The text will say something like that. In other words, they made them pay taxes. They used them as a workforce. But they kept them in the land, 
And now we get to the days of the kings in 1 Kings 15, and Asa is a king. Hundreds of years after Moses, and these perverted persons are still in the land. And, and the perversion actually is um, occurring among the Israelites themselves. So 1 Kings 18 deals with all of, again, very specific um, sexual sins. Then you get down to 1 Kings, I'm sorry, then you get down to Leviticus 18, 24. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things, for by all these things the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled. Therefore I will visit the, uh, the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out in it its inhabitants. If you want to know God's view on sexual perversion, look at this phrase here. The land vomits out its inhabitants. Okay? Not a lot of people, I don't know anybody personally that enjoys vomiting or that likes to watch somebody else vomit. I've, <laughs> I've never encountered somebody that really, that you man, that's something I look forward to. I cannot wait till the next time I throw up. This is God's perspective on sexual perversion. And because Israel didn't do what God said do, again, now you're hundreds of, le hundreds of years later, you're in 1 Kings 15, and you have a good king, Asa, and he has to banish the perverted persons from the land. These people have been a thorn in Israel's side because you go back hundreds of years and people didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, there, there can be immediate temporal consequences to sin, and there were in this case, but there can also be consequences from this, like this current generation doing something that will affect people years and years and years down the road. And that's exactly what we see happening here. But Asa is one of these reformer kings. Um, you look through this text. Um, Asa is also, you go to Second Kings, or I'm sorry, Second Chronicles chapter 15, and you can read about more of his information there. Um, uh, let's see. He removed all the idols from his father that his fathers had made. Also, he re removed Maacah, his grandmother, from being queen mother. And you see that throughout the Kings and the Chronicles, that this person so-and-so got to the throne and his mother's name was. It's like you have, a, uh, you have a, almost a co-regency with a mother or a grandmother. Well, why did he cast out his grandmother? And this, to me, this speaks to the character of Asa, because she had made an obscene image of Asherah, and Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron. So he's, I mean, this is grandma. Well, uh, you know, God is no respecter of persons, and his people cannot be respecters of persons. So Asa is one of these good kings. Um, but, okay, how many times have I said on this live stream, one of the most important words in all the Bible is that three-letter word, but. So he's doing these good things, and that's good, obviously. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord his God, or to the Lord all his days. These high places are various regions, and they would do it in high places, on hills, um, uh, places of idol worship. So he's doing, he, he's, he's doing what we would call reformation, but all of these, um, what, like hot spots of idolatry still exist. But he's doing what's right. He's leading the nation in a right direction. And again, he's a king for 41 years. Some of these kings, as we're going to go through, you're going to see, uh, well, one, I think it's, it's either Zimri or Omri of Israel, reign for seven days. So sometimes you have six months or a year or two, but then you have reformers like Asa who last for 41 years. Notice this. He also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he had which he himself had dedicated, things, uh, you know, silver and gold and utensils. So he's doing good. But you will notice this. There's still war between uh, Israel and Judah. Now, you'll remember back up in verse 1 that he becomes king. I'm sorry, in verse 8, he becomes king in the 20th year of Jeroboam. 
And this is where that overlapping of the names and the, and the years can get a bit confusing. 20th year of Jeroboam. But then, um, the next king we read is Baasha. Well, we're, we'll read about him in the next, uh, in the next section. Um, so he's for, he, <laughs> Jeroboam's king for 22 years. Asa becomes king of Judah in his 20th year, but reigns for 41. So Baasha is the next king of Israel after Jeroboam. Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, the king of Judah. And you'll remember I've talked about this when Jeroboam and Rehoboam split. Jeroboam changed the locations and, and dates and objects of worship because he knew that if people kept going to Jerusalem, you know, his his kingdom essentially could fall to Rehoboam. And, you know, well, if you don't have a kingdom, you can't be king. And it, it seems that same uh, mindset continues here with Baasha. Um, he'll build up fortified cities like Ramah to to prevent a, um, oh, how would you say it, to, to prevent maybe some type of uh, compromise or something like that, defection from his people to go back to southern. So it becomes very political. Well, what does Asa do? Takes all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. And this goes back to the days of David and Solomon. All the valuable things that they put in the temple. Delivered them into the hands of his servants. And Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad. Now here's another problem. And we're going to see this <clears throat> throughout the kings. When they get in trouble, what do they do? Well, they're going to seek out political and military alliances from outside sources. And that is something that God forbade them doing. Again, uh, uh, what is it? Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 4. You don't make any covenants with anybody else. Well, Asa's a good king, but when, when northern Israel starts putting pressure on him, uh, he takes all the valuable things out of the house of the Lord. He gives them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria who dwelled in Damascus. And, well, what are they going to do with that? Well, let's make a treaty. All right. Political arrangements here between you and me. As there was war between my father and your father, see, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. Come and break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So, they do that. And, uh, for kings... That's about it for Asa. Um, all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So I think we're going to stop for today because we're already at 30 minutes. But I think we're going to hit some of that tomorrow. We'll go look at Chronicles and some of the things that Asa did there because we're given a lot more information in Chronicles on Asa than we are in 1 Kings 15 verses 8 through 24 here. So what have we got? Well, we've got northern Israel, Jeroboam. And then we learn through Asa's account here that the second king is Baasha. Southern Israel, we've got uh, Rehoboam, Abijah, and Asa. So, get your Bible charts. Get a Bible timeline. Go to your grocery store and find one of those things I was talking to you about. You, you can order those things online, but it's, uh, it's not uncommon to find them in Walmart or a grocery store book section, something like that. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you being on here today. Um, it's Wednesday, so this is the last stream of this week. Of course, tonight we'll be going live. If you're somewhere that does not have Wednesday night services or you're sick and not able to get out, we go live at 7 p.m. Central. And tonight we'll be studying in Mammoth Spring, um, Psalms 70 through 73. So that will be available. All right, guys. That's it. And by the way, let me say this. Several of you have sent me birthday wishes. Today's my birthday. Thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your friendship. So uh, hope you have a good day and hope to see you back here Monday at 11 o'clock.